Hi, this is Chris, President of Pinnacle Training Consulting Systems. Welcome. Thanks for joining me today to talk about the shoulder. More specifically, talking about the functionality around the shoulder and the shoulder girdle. The biomechanics of the shoulder and the weak links. The weak links mean there's one major area per the research that is a target weak link that we need to work on with our clients who have shoulder injuries. In addition, talking about some assessments of the shoulder and the pathology between shoulder impingement syndrome versus shoulder bursitis, which I think is really key. The other part I want to talk about is corrective training strategies. How to work with those clients who have shoulder impingement syndrome versus shoulder bursitis. So let's get right at it. So the shoulder, it's a ball and socket joint. Again, it moves into flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external internal rotation. But when we look at the shoulder, specifically here, the functional anatomy, there's four major rotator cuff muscles. Subscapularis in the front, teres minor and infraspinatus in the back, which do external rotation, and then supraspinatus, which does abduction. So those are the four primary we call workhorse of the shoulder. In addition, around the shoulder, the serratus anterior, which comes down below around the 8 to 12 ribs, wraps around the shoulder, does protraction of the shoulder. And of course, you have your anterior deltoid in the front, which does shoulder flexion, medial deltoid on the side, which is going to do abduction, that works very nicely with the supraspinatus. And again, posteriorly, you've got the posterior deltoid, which does horizontal abduction. So that's a quick little, just a functional anatomy overview. Biomechanically, when the arm is flexed, the humerus is going to glide down. So when I say glide, it means it translates. When you extend the arm, it does the opposite. It goes actually forward. If you look here now on side raising or abduction, the humerus has to go down and slide within the glenoid cavity. If it doesn't slide down, it actually will impinge or hit the arch of the shoulder joint. Okay, so those are the classic, basic biomechanics of the shoulder. When you externally rotate your shoulder, the humor has slides backward initially and then it glides forward. When you go into internal rotation, the humerus again goes forward and slides posteriorly. Okay, so that's just a little bit of preview about biomechanics and simplifying deep inside the shoulder socket. Now, the weak link. There's one major weak link that has been shown in the research, and, and I've just read over and over again, and that's the supraspinatus. Every research I've shown that I've read with pictures, with those who have rotator cuff dysfunction, the average Joe or layman person, supraspinatus from the supraspinous spinous of the greater tubercle, again, does abduction, is commonly injured. So, why is it injured? Well, the reason why it's injured, it's weaker. It's weaker than subscapularis, which is a bigger muscle that pulls into internal rotation forward. You've got your two rotator cuff, your external and infraspinatus and teres minor, that does external rotation. And again, medial deltoid, this big power muscle pulls up the humerus. But the supraspinatus helps make that motion happen. But when it's injured, or what causes injury is repetitive overuse over and over time, like someone in working for the post office. Trauma or falls. A pitcher who throws a ball repeatedly is constantly using that shoulder and the supraspinatus repetitively over all the time. So again, supraspinatus is the weak link within the shoulder girdle. In terms of assessments, now the main assessment I would say really is active movement. Looking what the person can do. And if you also look at them with the shoulder wall test and they do a shoulder push-up, you're going to look at the mechanics of how the shoulder is gliding on the thorax. So with a male client, how that thorax, uh, how that scapula is going to glide on the upper back. Right? So those are a quick couple of assessments you can do that are nice, simple, and really straightforward. The key though, when someone raises their arm and they kind of do this, or have a hitch, you know something's going on because that humerus is not gliding down. And how many of you have been stuck before? Stuck in a place to go? Well, the humerus doesn't like to be stuck. And if it doesn't glide down, it'll jam into the AC joint. Something to think about again. Now, when we talk about pathology, 
Well, one of the things that I see with the therapist all the time is shoulder impingement syndrome. Let me clarify what that means. So it basically means there is a crowding of that area, meaning that the humerus, when you shoulder or side raise your arm, or even when you flex your arm, it's butting heads into this arch, the coracromial arch. What that means is either there's not enough space because of the type of the AC, which is structural, or the mechanics behind here is that the scapula isn't gliding in the thorax. So when someone raises their arm sideways, that scapula doesn't glide up. And if that doesn't glide up and goes just up like that, it can be tightness of the upper traps, levator scapula. Some of these accessory muscles are guarding. So that's one real basic difference between uh, about impingement. Inside the shoulder, you've got, again, we talk about the supraspinous tendon. Below that, you also have what's called a bursa, called the septal bursa. If that bursa is irritated or swollen or agitated through repetitive overuse, especially with repetitive abduction or reaching, it becomes inflamed. And a person may complain of pain lying at night, sleeping is painful, they won't want to sleep on it, and that last bit of movement will be painful and stiff. They may have still good range of motion, but that last bit is going to be limited. All right? So they tend to respond very nicely to ice and resting. Now the classic metal management, mental management between the two is impingement. May get some NSAIDs or non steroids. They're not getting a lot better. They're going to complain of pain that's globally in the front, maybe even a band around the shoulder. This pain in that front part of the interdeltoid. They're going to come in with rounded shoulders. This protracted kind of caved in, which shortens the pecs, shortens the later scapulae, and shortens all these structures front, as well as the anterior capsule. Bursitis, they're just going to be painful when they're moving it. So that's how one, we as therapists can differentiate and how you can something to look at if you meet a client who's been through impingement syndrome or bursitis is what they've been through. Now, let's talk about how do you work with clients who have that. So if someone has impingement syndrome, again, the humerus has to glide. If it butts into this arch, it's going to be painful. So what we need to do is we actually need to stretch the pecs. So stretching the pecs will lengthen pec major and pec minor, which are typically causing rotation or interrotation of the shoulder, number one. Number two, we want to stretch the posterior capsule. By giving yourself a nice little hug, posterior capsule is like a cobweb. This cobweb is right back here. This gets very tight. And if this gets very tight, that can, can be attributed to shoulder impingement as well. From an exercise point of view, you want to do rows. Things like mid-row, low trapezius row. The reason why is, by doing rows, you're taking pressure up the front of the shoulder, you're transferring that force backwards, and you're decreasing that compressive load, the things you don't want to do. You don't want to do shoulder press. Shoulder press is going to be basically compressing right on the AC joint, the supraspinatus, and that bursa. So someone you know has impingement syndrome, the last thing you want to do is really get onto doing shoulder press. Eventually getting doing some light side raises or side delt work, delt work and doing reverse flies. Reverse flies is going to hit the posterior delt, which will unload that front of the shoulder. I think the key thing in life, just like anything else, is balance. If you remember the following, stretch the front, strengthen the, the back, or stretch these tight muscles and strengthen the weaker, that's one thing that would be huge to help those clients. Now with bursitis, they're probably going to be done with therapy, they're probably going to be using arm pretty well, but they may be weak. They can actually get into doing side raising pretty quickly, but the same thing goes applies. I work on stretching the chest. They're not going to be as tight in the pec region, but they're definitely going to be tight. They don't need to be stretching the poster capsule because that poster capsule is not going to be stiff. I would do rows, low trapezius, even one arm rows. Everything will work these scapular stabilize to retract, to pull, to change those guide wires. Think of a bar of body as a guide wire system. And if we're coming in, standing rounded and caving like a lot of people you see your clients, we need to short, lengthen that short guide wire. 
by lengthening the transverse of the forest backwards, we create more symmetry and balance. And then strengthen these weaker muscles back here. I hope that makes sense. This is my explanation about the difference between impingement syndrome versus bursitis. And I hope this corrective training approach gives you some more insight on things you can use in meeting with your clients. Thanks again for joining me. I look forward to talking in the future.